Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.6.2.2 Synaptic Transmission from the AQA A Level Biology Specification. So here's what we've got to know. We need to know the detailed structure of a synapse and of a neuromuscular junction. Then we need to know the sequence of events involved in transmission across a cholinergic synapse. We need to know the sequence of events in sufficient detail to explain unidirectionality, temporal and spatial summation, and inhibition by inhibitory synapses. And finally, we need to be able to compare transmission across cholinergic synapses and neuromuscular junctions. The spec also says students should be able to use information provided to predict and explain effects of specific drugs on a synapse. So let's make a start. First of all, what is a synapse? Well, a synapse is a junction between two neurons or between a neuron and a muscle, in which case it is called a neuromuscular junction. They are found at the ends of axons. Most synapses outside the central nervous system, the CNS, use the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which can be shortened to ACH with a capital C, hence them being called cholinergic synapses. So here we have a diagram of a synapse. We have the presynaptic neuron where the action potential arrives. We have voltage gated calcium ion channels as well as vesicles containing acetylcholine. The presynaptic neuron is surrounded by the presynaptic membrane. Then we have the synaptic cleft, the space in between the pre and postsynaptic neurons, and the postsynaptic neuron, surrounded by the postsynaptic membrane, which contains sodium ion channels which have receptors where acetylcholine can bind to. So how does transmission across a cholinergic synapse work? First of all, an action potential arrives at the synaptic knob of the presynaptic neuron. This stimulates voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, allowing calcium ions to diffuse into the synapse. The increase in concentration of calcium ions in the synapse triggers synaptic vesicles to move to the presynaptic membrane and fuse with it, releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. This is known as exocytosis. Acetylcholine then diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. This causes sodium ion channels to open, allowing sodium ions to diffuse into the postsynaptic neuron, resulting in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. If the threshold is reached, a new action potential is generated. Note that acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, and products are reabsorbed by the presynaptic neuron, where ATP hydrolysis provides energy for A and CH to combine to produce ACH. The cycle is then ready to restart. To recap nerve impulses and how action potentials are triggered, just follow the link to my video on nerve impulses top right. So next we need to know about the principles of unidirectionality, summation and inhibition. Cholinergic synapses are unidirectional. This is because the impulse can only travel in one direction because receptors are only found on the postsynaptic membrane. Neurotransmitter also can only be made and released from the presynaptic neuron. We also need to know about the principle of summation. Low frequency action potentials cause insufficient amounts of neurotransmitter to be released to trigger a new action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. They can however be made to do so in summation. There are two types of summation, spatial and temporal. Spatial summation is when a number of presynaptic neurons connect to a single postsynaptic neuron. Together they release enough neurotransmitter to exceed the threshold and trigger a new action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Temporal summation is when a single presynaptic neuron releases neurotransmitter many times over a short period of time. If the total amount of neurotransmitter released results in a voltage that is greater than the threshold value of the postsynaptic neuron, a new action potential is triggered. Next we have inhibition. Some synapses make it less likely that a new action potential will be triggered at the postsynaptic neuron. Such synapses are called inhibitory synapses. Neurotransmitter may bind to chloride ion channels causing them to open, allowing chloride ions to diffuse into the postsynaptic neuron. They may also cause potassium ion channels to open, meaning that potassium ions diffuse out of the postsynaptic neuron and into the synaptic cleft. Overall, an even more negative membrane potential is generated, around minus 80 millivolts. 
This is called hyperpolarization. Because of hyperpolarization, we need an even greater amount of sodium ions to diffuse into the postsynaptic membrane to create a voltage that exceeds the threshold value and triggers an action potential. Next, we need to know the structure of a neuromuscular junction. This is quite similar to a cholinergic synapse. A neuromuscular junction is a synapse between a motor neuron and a bundle of muscle fibers, which is known as a motor unit. There are many neuromuscular junctions along a muscle, meaning that all fibers contract simultaneously and rapidly. If only a small force is needed, only few units are stimulated. The arrangement into units allows more control over the force a muscle exerts. Note that at neuromuscular junctions, the postsynaptic membrane is folded into lots of clefts that store the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. We also need to be able to compare the differences between cholinergic synapses and neuromuscular junctions. As mentioned before, a cholinergic synapse connects a neuron to another neuron or effector organ, whereas a neuromuscular junction connects a motor neuron to a bundle of muscle fibers called a motor unit. In cholinergic synapses, neurons may be motor, sensory or relay neurons, whereas at neuromuscular junctions, only motor neurons are involved. Cholinergic synapses may be excitatory or inhibitory, and neuromuscular junctions are always excitatory. In a cholinergic synapse, a new action potential may be triggered at the postsynaptic neuron, whereas at a neuromuscular junction, the action potential ends here. It is the end of the neural pathway. At a cholinergic synapse, acetylcholine binds to receptors on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron, whereas at a neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine binds to receptors on the membrane of muscle fibers. The postsynaptic membrane has less receptors at a cholinergic synapse, whereas the postsynaptic membrane has more receptors at a neuromuscular junction. And finally, at a cholinergic synapse, there is buildup of postsynaptic potential, which can lead to an action potential. However, at a neuromuscular junction, the result is a wave of depolarization which spreads along the muscle fibers. There are, however, also some similarities between cholinergic synapses and neuromuscular junctions. Neurotransmitter, for example, is transported by diffusion in both. Both have receptors that cause an influx of sodium ions when neurotransmitter binds. They also both use a sodium-potassium pump to repolarize the axon. And finally, both use enzymes to break down neurotransmitter. Finally, we should also be able to interpret information provided to predict and explain the effects of specific drugs on synapses. You probably should be able to answer these questions already based on what you've learned about synapses and how they work, but I'll just cover a bit on what different drugs may do. Some may have a similar shape to a type of neurotransmitter, and so may also bind to receptors and trigger sodium ion channels to open, triggering action potentials. Other drugs may also bind to receptors, but act as blockers, preventing neurotransmitters from binding, and so fewer sodium ion channels open, and fewer action potentials are triggered. And finally, some drugs may inhibit enzymes that break down neurotransmitter, so more neurotransmitter remains in the synaptic cleft that can bind to receptors, so more action potentials can continue to be triggered. Great, that would be synaptic transmission covered. We've covered the detailed structure of a synapse and of a neuromuscular junction. We've covered the sequence of events that are involved in transmission across a cholinergic synapse in sufficient detail to explain the principles of unidirectionality, temporal and spatial summation, and inhibition by inhibitory synapses. We've covered transmission across a cholinergic synapse and across neuromuscular junctions. And finally, we've considered some of the effects that drugs may have on synapses. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we will be covering skeletal muscles, how they are stimulated to contract by nerves and act as effectors.